So yeah, today we have a very uh, good opportunity, and um, we all of us at the Sangha at the monastery we are humble respect to Tanajan Brahmavadi and all the bhikkhuni and all of our friends who are here. And yeah, this is Oksa uh, Buddha Vihara. We all welcome. And it's done. Okay. Uh, ready. Thank you. Ready. <laughs> wonderful. Okay. I'd have to take the mic, right? Uh, yeah. Can is it working already? Well, yeah. well, has it been turned on or does it yeah, have to be just, turned on? Just yeah. press at the end. Yeah. Press. Uh, okay. There we go. I can't see anything about my glasses. I can see. Blur, I can see it's a microphone, but it's not there. <laughs> so, oh, wow, okay. But be careful here. So, um, uh, nice to meet you all here. Huh? Yeah, is this the whole of Buddhist population in Oxford? Huh? Is everyone here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, there's more. Okay, good. I was getting a bit concerned there for a minute. Huh? If this is it, then it's we need to do some missionary work quickly here. Yeah. I think that was one of the things that Richard Gombrich was saying, yeah, that uh, Buddhism is kind of like a missionary religion. Yeah. Remember he said that? Did you know Richard Gombrich? Yeah, he was a professor just up the road here at Oxford, somewhere in Oxford University. I don't really understand these British institutions. With so many colleges and so many weird things going on, but he was up there somewhere. Yeah. And he was arguing, because he was a professor of Sanskrit for, I think, about 30 years at Oxford, for a long time. Yeah. And I know him a little bit, not very much, but just a little bit. Yeah. And he was arguing that Buddhism is a missionary religion. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I think, I think there is some truth to it, but you have to kind of qualify it a little bit. Like with so many things in life, it has to be qualified. And of course, the idea of Buddhism is ideas that are universally applicable to everyone. It's ideas about happiness and suffering. And because everyone in the world, presumably, is interested in happiness and suffering, if we believe that we have a message to deliver to the world, then it is kind of a missionary religion. But it's missionary with a twist. It's not about it's not about converting people for conversion's sake. There's a bit of feedback or something here. Coming afterwards, can you hear that? It's not about converting people no, just hold it low. for conversion's sake. Okay. <laughs> um, it is about converting it's about making Buddhists then, so they can practice the Dhamma. It's about kind of convincing them that this is a good way. So they become real practitioners of the Buddhist path. That, that is the purpose of Buddhist uh, uh, conversion, if you like. Not really conversion, Buddhist uh, missionary work, if you like. Uh, and so it's very, quite different from what they do maybe in other teachings, other religions, uh, where the conversion is kind of in its own right is very important. Uh, Whereas in Buddhism, it's about actually convincing someone that this path is really worthwhile. And of course, a very important part of that is the idea of right view, right or right perspective, seeing the world in the right way. And so one of the, this is what the talk is going to be about today, right perspective. And one of the kind of beautiful ways of defining right view, and this is kind of interesting, we often talk about right view in terms of very, what may seem like kind of metaphysical terms, we talk about rebirth and karma and these kind of things, and it's kind of often you may believe in it or you may not, or you may have doubts or whatever, but it's a little bit kind of distant from us, the idea of rebirth. Yeah, it's not something that's very tangible. So a better way of defining the idea of right view, in my opinion, is that right view is about understanding where happiness is to be found there, and where suffering is to be found there, and then including also the path to these things. Uh, that is a very simple definition. Uh, if you understand the distinction between the two, uh, it enables you to pursue one uh, and to avoid the other one, uh, especially if you also understand the path. Uh, and if you think about this, it kind of makes really uh, good sense. Yeah? This fits in with the idea of the Four Noble Truths. The First Noble Truth is about the uh, Dukkha Satcha, uh, Anyone? Are you Pali scholars? Anyone here? Huh? Yeah, a little bit of Pali. Dukkha Satcha, yeah? truth of Dukkha, right? First noble truth. Huh? We have the uh, Samudya Satcha, uh, Niroda Satcha, and the Magga Satcha, the four noble truths. Huh? And of course, Dukkha Satcha, noble truth about suffering. So if we understand suffering, yeah, we also understand happiness, huh? because these are two sides of the same coin. So <coughs> really, the right view in Buddhism is about understanding suffering and happiness. Huh? And that is pretty good stuff, yeah? Everyone in the world pretty much wants that. And so we really, as Buddhists, we really have, as far as I'm concerned, 
we have the answer to the meaning of life. And that is pretty powerful stuff. Uh, yeah? It's like dynamite. Uh, it's like, is that true? You got the answer to the meaning of life? Well, if you got it, I want it. Uh, I want to be part of this. Uh, and that was a bit kind of my sort of um, introduction to Buddhism. I started to realize that this actually is the answer to the meaning of life. And I guess I was like most people, when you're young, you're quite inquiring. You want to find out what you're going to do with your life and all of these kinds of things. Uh, and so, of course, the meaning of life really matters. What is it? Uh, and then you think after what well, that maybe there is no meaning to life. This is a kind of a very common idea in the modern world. Uh, and then you come to Buddhism and you find that actually there is a... Uh, that's pretty powerful. Huh? And so this is kind of the root idea yeah, about happiness and suffering. And of course, once you have an idea about the difference between happiness and suffering, yeah, then you have an idea of what you need to do, because the causes for these things come as, as part and parcel of these understandings and insights. Uh, then you understand what you actually need to do. And this is why right view is the foundation of everything else uh, in Buddhism. Uh, from that right view arises all the other fact arise all the other factors of the noble eightfold path. Uh, yeah, coming out of that. Uh, so right view is the foundation for uh, everything in Buddhism, uh, and not only is it the foundation of everything on the path, but it is also directly the foundation for meditation practice itself. Uh, yeah, because if you have right view uh, in your meditation, you bring that to your meditation practice. Uh, it means that when you sit down. Uh, you have the right kind of values, you have the right idea, you direct your mind in the right direction. You're not interested in those things that are suffering or dukkha. And because you're not interested in those things, you leave those to one side and you're able to let go of those things very easily. And instead you direct your mind in the right way. So once you have the right view, meditation is easy, right? There's, kind of, there's no thinking, there's no kind of worrying about the, the world. You just sit down, bang, and you bliss out and you are so happy. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, and this is kind of because right view guides your mind at that particular point. Uh, and so you will find that someone who is like a stream enterer, for example, the Sotapanna on the Buddhist path, uh, is someone who can go into meditation easily. Uh, because they have right view, they know exactly where to lean their mind to uh, conduct their mind in the right directions. They will enter Samadhi very, very easily. Uh. And so this is one of the tests, right, to see if someone really has any insight into the Buddhist path. Uh, how quickly can you attain samadhi here? So next time you see you know, someone you think might be a stream enter, ask them this question here. How quickly can you enter samadhi? Yeah, what, is it easy for you? Huh? And if they say, yeah, samadhi, not sure if it, is, you know, if it is kind of whatever required or it's not really all that interesting or whatever, huh? and then maybe you have some, uh, you know, at least you have some idea of measuring it and <laughs> who knows something about the Buddhist path. Huh? So right view, yeah, at the very beginning, allows the whole path to work and allows specifically meditation practice to work. Yeah. And this is uh, extraordinarily important and very interesting in so many different ways. Uh, one of the problems in life is that when we are born into this world, uh, we are born with these things called the vipalasas, yeah, the distortions of the mind. Uh, we are born with wrong view. Uh, and vipalasas is actually very it's a very minor teaching in the Sutta, but it's quite interesting here. Yeah. It's the idea of how the mind is distorted. In other words, it doesn't see things in accordance with reality, yeah, but it sees things in a distorted way. Yeah. And this is kind of very fascinating here. Yeah. And uh, one of the very significant parts of this distortion, of course, is the idea that you are deluded. Yeah. So when you enter the word, world, uh, you are deluded. By definition in Buddhism, you have to be deluded, because if you weren't deluded, you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be born. So you have, by the, you know, that's kind of a given, in a sense, of the Buddhist path. So you are deluded, but the problem with delusion is that you have absolutely no idea how deluded you are, or how deep it goes, or exactly how it is that you are deluded, because delusion is blind to itself, right? You have no idea what's going on there. If you come into this world, you arrive into this world, and you know if you become a Buddhist that something isn't right, but you don't know what is wrong. You have no idea what is going on there. And, uh, you know, in the, uh, the way the Vipalasas are talked about in the suttas, they talked about the uh, distortions of perception, the distortions of mind, and the distortions of view. Huh? So basically, your entire mind, everything that goes on inside your, you know, your thinking world or whatever, all of it is wrong, basically, in some way or another. Huh? You know that, uh, but you don't know exactly where it goes or what it is. Huh? Please come in. Huh? Please enter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
And um, so, to, just to give you a, r a rough kind of uh, maybe idea of what these vipalasas are, so they are the distortions of views, perception, and mind. Yeah, so basically your entire mental world is distorted, and of course the distortions are the typical things you would expect in Buddhism. Yeah, seeing things that are impermanent as permanent, or at least more permanent. Uh, seeing happiness where there's suffering, seeing a self where there is non-self. The last one is seeing beauty, where something is actually not really all that beautiful after all. Huh? So it's basically a distortion of some of the fundamental ways that we look at the world. Huh? So what does that mean in practice? Huh? Well, what it means in practice, huh, basically, uh, is that we have to kind of try to rectify this view. Huh? Yeah, rectify the distortions of the mind. Huh? And not only do we have to rectify, but because we have no idea how profound this distortion actually is. Uh, there is a kind of a concern, right? A sense of urgency about this. Uh, I have no idea how far I kind of away I am from the Dhamma. No idea what is going on. You have some idea because you can tell a little bit by how your meditation goes and these kind of things. Uh, but essentially we have no idea how distorted our outlook is. Uh, so it becomes kind of scary. Uh, what if your outlook is really, really bad and you kind of you have a lot of work ahead of you to actually sort this out? Uh, that's concerning, yeah. Uh, and so it gets a sense of idea, I have to get going with this path, get going and to restore, not restore is actually the wrong, the wrong word, I have to sort out my wrong views, sort out the distortions of the mind, get them aligned with the Dhamma, with the word of the Buddha, and then these things actually will start to work in the right way. So this is the right way of thinking about our life when we come into this world. That there is a very serious problem there at the root of the kind of our our cognitive abilities and the way we actually see the world. So, and this is one of the interesting reasons why when you read the suttas and you read the word of the Buddha, one of the things that he talks about quite often, especially in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, he talks about various kinds of perceptions, yeah, the development of perceptions. So you see things like anicca sanya, yeah, perception of impermanence, you have the uh, you have the dukkha anicca sanya, the seeing the impermanence. No, sorry, sorry, anicca dukkha sanya, seeing suffering and what is impermanent. Uh, yeah, and so you have these all of these perceptions that you're supposed to develop. Why? Because it actually restores or it, it enables you to see the world in the way that the Buddha saw the world. Gradually, gradually, stage by stage, it kind of starts to realign or aligns your way of looking at the world with the way the Buddha saw the world, which of course is supposed to be the way the world actually is. But it is, um, the habits that we have are very strong. Yeah, These delusions or distortions of the mind are very powerful, and they come from a very deep past. From a Buddhist point of view, they come from you know lifetimes and lots of maybe eons into the past. And so because of that, we have this incredibly powerful habits from the past yeah, that are moving uh, kind of with a tremendous momentum from the past. Uh, and because of that, it actually takes a lot of hard work to turn these perceptions, these views around, coming around in a, in a kind of the opposite way of what they are already. Uh, because if we are seeing permanence in what is impermanent, uh, it means that we have the exact opposite view uh, of what we're supposed to have. Yes, We have to turn these habits around 180 degrees. Uh, and I like to kind of have this idea that because our habits are so powerful, uh, it's a bit like a super tanker. Uh, yeah, a super tanker going at full speed on the ocean. Uh, it takes kilometers, I don't know, 20 kilometers or whatever, or to turn these tankers around because the momentum is so large. Uh, and for us, it is maybe even worse. Yeah, we don't really count in kilometers how long it takes to turn around the right view. Uh, it's not a practical way of thinking about right view, but say, years, right? Years and years and years of work, and then gradually coming around uh, and turning around the other direction. Uh. So this is what we're up against. Uh. And because we don't really know exactly what we're up against, uh, there's a sense of urgency. We need to develop the right view, which happens through developing perceptions uh, and thinking about the world in the right way, and contemplating these teachings. Uh, so that gradually it comes around. Uh. So this is uh, the idea of the uh, uh, distortions of the mind, right, and how important that is then to rectify this. Uh, another way uh, of thinking about this is then to consider the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, right? Factor number one, Noble Eightfold Path, Samma Ditti, uh, yeah, the right view. And the second factor, Samma Sankapa, 
So without right view, you cannot have the second factor, Samma Sankapa. What is Samma Sankapa? It is translated variously sometimes as right thought or right intention. Yeah, right intention, I think, is pretty close. But it may not, I, I my preferred translation of Samma Sankapa is something <coughs> like right purpose, right aim, or right goal. Yeah, that we are moving towards something that actually is useful. So that kind of makes it to me more clear what is going on. The goal and the purpose of the path are kind of coming into view. And of course, to have the right kind of goal, you're going to have to have right view, first of all. Please come in. Yeah. <laughs> if you... Okay. Very good. Hello, hi. <laughs> If you view things uh, in the wrong way, uh, there is no way you can have the right goal. Yeah? If you think that the goal should be over there because you have the wrong kind of view, uh, but the goal is actually over there, uh, you're heading in the wrong direction uh, and you have the wrong intention as a consequence. Uh. So... So for right intention to be possible, you have to have right view, first of all. When you see things right, then you can have the right kind of goal. And it's kind of very obvious when you think about it. And I often think about some very worldly similes to kind of make this point very clear. Yeah, and one of them I think about is like when you're going to invest, for example, you're going to invest your money maybe on the stock market. I'm not sure if anyone here is into that, but if you're going to invest your money on the stock market, you need to know which companies are worthy of investing in, right? If you have a bad stockbroker who tells you all the wrong kind of information, you have wrong view. And then when you have wrong view about the stock, so you go invest in the wrong kind of stock, so the goal is wrong. Yeah, when the goal is wrong, you invest, you lose all your money. What happens when you lose all your money? You suffer. Maybe you don't, I don't know. Do you, what, what happens with you here? Do you suffer when you lose all your money? Or are you kind of, yay, lost all money? Now I can become a monk or another. So I don't know what you, what you think. But that's one possible solution to that problem, right? It's kind of handy here. Yeah. So usually people suffer when they lose all their money, right? Oh no. Why? Because they had wrong view. Huh? This is exactly the same thing you have on the Noble Eightfold Path. Huh? If you have wrong view, huh, it causes suffering at the end of the day. You have wrong goal, which is kind of the second factor. When you have the wrong goal, huh, you're heading in the wrong direction, huh? suffering is a consequence. Huh? So right view is this kind of incredibly important thing at the very beginning here. Yeah? So we need to develop that. And, of course, one of the points I've been making uh, now all along is this idea that right view, uh, you have to develop it, which means that it is not kind of either you have it or you don't. Yeah, I believe in rebirth, I'm finished with right view. It's not really like that. Uh, it is something that you need to gradually approach, gradually come closer and closer to, uh, and gradually kind of align your view with the view of the Buddha, the way the world actually is. Uh, it's a very gradual and very slow kind of process. Uh, so this is the idea here. Yeah, it is so important because it is the foundation for everything else in Buddhism. Then, when you have the right view, of course, uh, or the right intention, uh, the path kind of unfolds. Uh, I tend to come back to this at the very end if I can remember uh, at the very end what I was saying at the beginning. Probably can't, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but that's fine. <laughs> see how things go. Uh, so um, that is kind of the uh, the basic idea. Now, how do we then actually do this? Yeah, what, what, how does actually this idea of right view, how do we uh, make this happen in our life? This is kind of the most important thing here. How do we uh, get the right view? Huh? And uh, the, um, actually, there's one more thing I should say about right view, really. This is one of my kind of favorite ideas about view, just to show you how important it is. Uh, yeah? As I was saying just now, it is a foundation of the Noble Eightfold Path, obviously, and everything else emerges from the idea of right view. Huh? And in fact, it is so powerful uh, that if you spend your entire life just focusing on right view, uh, you're causing the rest of the path to happen. Uh. All you have to do, listen to the word of the Buddha, uh, come back to the word of the Buddha, uh, come back to teachers who teach in the same way as the Buddha, come back to that again and again and again. Uh. And there's something that happens in your psychology where you have no choice anymore. You have to practice the noble eightfold path whether you want to or not. Uh. So if you don't want to practice it, now is the time to leave. Otherwise, you're going to be too late, right? You're going to get some more right view during this talk, I guarantee it. 
this is, I'm giving this last opportunity. Huh? Okay, I'm good. I'm glad to see no one, no, no one has left. That's really, really happy about that. Huh? So, and this symbol, there's a beautiful symbol in the sutta that expresses this idea of how right view is incredibly foundational for the path. Huh? And I just taught, taught a retreat up in the uh, Midlands, up in the Peak District National Park. Very beautiful up there. It's also very beautiful here in Oxford, I must say. Congratulations on living in such a beautiful place. <laughs> Are you, maybe you don't even live here. Do you live here, everyone? Huh? Some, no, don't live here? Okay, most people shaking their heads. Okay, anyway. What, you will live here. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, yeah, it's good. Huh? I just had this beautiful walk along the river with the, the tube animals here. It was really delightful. So, I, I'm in love with Oxford already, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this simile, right? So, um, uh, the Buddha says, uh, yeah, it's like uh, the rain falling on the mountaintop. Uh, some of you probably heard the simile before, uh, but it's a simile of the rain on the mountaintop uh, signifies meeting uh, the Saparis. The Saparis are the superior people in the world, yeah, the noble ones, the Buddha, uh, the Buddha and all these real disciples. Uh, and when you have the Saparisa Sanseva, which means association with the noble ones, uh, you can say hanging out with the noble ones, yeah? Sometimes hanging out is kind of nice. Hanging out means it kind of you're relaxed about things. Yeah, hanging out has this kind of casual feel about it. Uh, and that actually is maybe a good way to be with the Aryans. Uh, it shouldn't be too formal. Sometimes we get so incredibly formal in this Buddhist world. I'm very glad to see the venerable here are quite relaxed, right? Uh, good. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the way it should be because when you are relaxed, uh, meditation usually goes better. Uh, when you are relaxed, that's what inside can happen. If you try too hard to kind of be you know, be the kind of perfect person or whatever, you can't relax, how can you possibly meditate if you can't relax? Because you're using willpower to hold yourself up, and there's no way that's going to work. So hanging out with the Sapurisa. Are you okay with that translation? Yeah, okay, your one is okay. The other one's here a bit more doubtful, but anyway, that's, uh, that's okay. So uh, association is a bit more formal. Hanging out is more kind of uh, casual. I don't know if you are aware of this. I'm going to go on all kind of tangents tonight because I can feel my mind is not very kind of... Anyway, <laughs> well, there, there are some... Uh, uh, trans all kinds of translations of the suttas. Yeah? And some translations are very formal and some are really, really informal, right? And I, I, don't, I don't even dare to say the words here tonight that some people use yeah? for, for some of these translations. You can get the whole spectrum of translations uh, and uh, that kind of fascinating. So you should be aware of that. So sometimes you can go online uh, and you can find translations that are kind of super cool translations. Uh, and then you have the formal ones, right? And you have kind of everything in between. Uh. So Mika Bodhi is quite formal. Uh. And then Sujato is a little bit more kind of relaxed translation, but easy to understand. Uh. And then you have some American people, um, people, I should say people. So one, I think one American guy who has this really kind of cool language, yeah, the suttas. Uh. And uh, they're all kind of uh, acceptable, perhaps. Uh, perhaps, uh, you have to read them to know. But they're all acceptable in a certain way. Different translations speak to different people. Uh. But anyway, the point is, uh, yeah, you are associating, you're hanging out with these superior people. Uh. What happens when you associate with the superior people? You hear the good Dhamma, yeah? Sadhamma Samanam, yeah? This is from a sutta called... Uh, the Avijja Sutta, Anguttara 1061, in case you know your suttas. Are people here knowledge about suttas? Uh, sutta numbers and things? Uh, yeah? One, knowledgeable. Two, three, I know these are knowledgeable already. <laughs> Five, knowledgeable over here. And, uh, yeah, this, I'm sure some of you are too shy. I know I mean that, you know the suttas backwards and forwards. Uh, but, uh, and then probably many others as well. Uh, yeah? So this particular sutta then, and then you, because you hang out with the noble ones, you hear the good Dhamma, Sadhamma Samadhamya. Because of that, you gain faith, yeah, or confidence in the teachings. Uh, because you have confidence in the teachings, you have yoniso manasikara, wise attention. Uh, because you have that, you have, uh, I'll probably get this series wrong, but you have, I think then you have sati sampajanya, uh, uh, full awareness. Uh, then I think you have the, uh, uh, then you have the, uh, uh, the sense restraint from that. Uh, then you have the fulfillment of the virtues. Uh, and then you have the four, Mindfulness meditation, the four satipatthanas, then you have the seven factors of awakening, then you have knowledge and liberation at the very end, the vijja vimuti. And each one of these stages follows from the previous one. Each one starts from the very bottom, the very root cause of vijja vimuti, knowledge and liberation, is hanging out with the noble ones. 
And the simile of the mountaintop says, if you just keep rain, raining on the top, and the rain here is the idea of associating with noble people. Man. If you keep the rain coming on the, noble, on the mountaintop, uh, <laughs> and that keeps on raining and raining and raining, yeah, yeah. that rain, that associated with the noble ones, and leads stage by stage all the way to liberation, all the way to freedom at the very end, uh, and to knowledge. Uh, because when it rains on the mountaintop, uh, the rain kind of collects into little streams, uh, those little streams collect into larger streams. The larger streams go into the little lakes. The little lakes overflow into larger streams again. They go into the large lakes. The large lakes overflow into the large rivers, like the River Ganges. Has anyone seen the River Ganges? Yeah? Pretty, pretty cool river, right? I mean, it makes the Thames look a little like a little brook in comparison. <laughs> There's this really enormous river here. And I really, I remember driving across the river Ganges near Patna, it's about two and a half kilometers something across this, this river. It's kind of really astonishing. Yeah. And uh, then, of course, those large rivers, the river Ganges or whatever, yeah, they go to the ocean. Yeah. And all you need uh, for those rivers to go to the ocean is for that rain on the mountaintop to continue. Yeah. If the rain on the mountaintop stops, uh, okay, the river may never go to the ocean because the lakes may not overflow or whatever. But if you keep on raining it on that mountaintop, guarantee that that water will eventually get to the ocean. And the ocean, of course, here is Nibbana. So all you really need to do, according to the simile, to get to Nibbana, is to listen to the suttas, listen to the word of the Buddha, understand what the Buddha is talking about. And as you do that, whether you want to or not, one day you're going to get to Nibbana. Or maybe you won't get there, but Nibbana will happen, yeah? depending on how you think about this. So that's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, that kind of extraordinary. And you think, is that really possible? How can that be the case? That, uh, or just by listening to these teachings. Uh, and of course, the reason is because you get gradually conditioned into this. Uh, and the motivation arises automatically from that conditioning. Uh, yeah? And then gradually, 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 this path kind of unfolds. Uh. But of course, you can't listen casually. You have to take a real interest in these teachings. Uh. You can't just kind of turn on the talk and kind of go walk around and do your ordinary chores and kind of listen in the background and hoping it will kind of seep into you through osmosis or whatever, yeah? Or you sleep at night and kind of play a Dhamma talk while you're sleeping. Yeah. That's not really, the, that's not the way to do it. Uh, I was just saying at the retreat we had now that there was a, a, a good friend of mine, a, a monk who, he wrote this article and the article was that uh, yous are listening to too many Dhamma talks. Uh, isn't that a nice title? I love that title for the, you know, for his little article. And the idea is that too many Buddhist people, they listen to Dhamma talks all the time, but they don't really pay proper, proper attention. It is much better to listen to a few Dhamma talks when you need to be inspired, when you need to kind of get a bit of oomph in your practice because it's kind of falling down a little bit. Listen, and when you listen, really listen, really try to get that message. When you read the sutta, Really read the sutta. Do it at the right time, at the right place, to inspire you, to kind of improve your understanding of what the Buddha is talking about. And when you do it at the right time in this way, then you will find it has a real impact. And one of the things the Buddha says that after you have heard a nice Dhamma talk, read a nice sutta, remember the Dhamma talks have to align with the suttas to really be useful. After you have heard it, reflect on it. Try to understand what is going on there. Try to kind of rectify your view in accordance with his teachings. Uh, yeah, all of these things uh, are part of this. Uh, and then these things really have power. Uh. So we need to listen in the right way. Uh, and when we listen in the right way, things tend to come together as a consequence. Uh, and then the rain on the mountaintop is really powerful. It's a strong rain. And this ordinary rain is like the monsoon rain in India. It's like the whole heavens just open up and it's like just really, really raining. Yeah. And then it works powerfully. Uh. So that is the right way of doing it. This is the power of right view. Uh, yeah, the rain on the mountaintop. Uh. So coming back now to uh, how we do this in practice. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the very important aspects of right view is that right view should should be something we feel. Right, it should not be something that is just purely an intellectual exercise. Yeah, you don't believe in this, you believe in that. Uh, if you really understand what is going on, it becomes emotionally powerful. Uh. And this is extraordinarily important because on the path or on any kind of thing in life, uh, what is it that drives us in life? Uh, what is it that motivates us? Is it intellectual ideas uh, or is it emotions? Uh, 
And we know that human beings are largely driven by emotions, right? When something feels right, that's when you do something. If you are inspired about Buddhism, that's when you practice this path. But if someone tells you you've got to do this because it's for your own good, and you say, yeah, yeah, whatever, it's not going to be very inspiring yet. Yeah, you need to be felt. It needs to be visceral. It needs to be something important to you. And so, um, for this reason, how we reflect on these teachings, that we enable kind of this... Uh, Feelings to come out of it is actually incredibly important. And one way of thinking about this uh, is to think about the anusatis, the recollections of the, uh, that we talk about in Buddhism. And uh, the very often the Buddha, when he talks about how to inspire yourself in meditation specifically, he recommends these anusatis, these recollections, uh, to be able to kind of give rise to a sense of inspiration. I think actually the word inspiration is a really good one. The Pali word is Veda. And the word Veda has this double meaning of understanding on the one hand and feeling on the other hand. Yeah, you have Vijja, which is related to the word Veda, and then you have Vedana, which is related to feeling and understanding coming together. And feeling and understanding together, that's like inspiration, right? If you are inspired, it means you understand, but you also feel something. That's kind of the whole point of inspiration. Right? And so that is what we need to do. And then when you are inspired, then the Buddha says, from the inspiration, comes the joy, yeah, comes the piti, from the piti comes the pasadi, from the pasadi comes the sukha, from the sukha comes the samadhi, from the samadhi comes yata buddha nana dasana, and all of these kind of things. I'm assuming your pali is really good now, but you know, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> so joy, uh, tranquility, happiness, and stillness, and then seeing things in accordance with reality, and all of these things coming out as a consequence. Uh, so what we need to do, we need to kind of, uh, first of all, we need to kind of understand these anusatis, uh, yeah, these recollections, uh, and what is interesting is that these recollections really are very closely associated with right view. Yeah, that's why I talk about them. They, they're not really talked about that so often, but actually, if you understand the Buddha in the right way, that understanding, that view of the Buddha, that is a right view. If you, I don't know how familiar, again, you are, some of you seem to be very familiar with the Sutta, so good on you, as I say in Australia. I'm going to teach you a few little bit of Australian idiom while I'm here. Uh, <laughs> so, good on you for that. Um, uh, and because one of the things that you see when it comes to right view, uh, yeah, sometimes it's the Four Noble Truths, and other times you have more kind of ordinary right view. Uh, and one of the aspects of right view there uh, is the idea that there are people in the world who are well practiced, who are well gone, uh, and who have an understanding of this world and the other world. Uh, in other words, it's the view that there are people in the world who have a certain degree of awakening and understanding that other people don't have. And of course, the primary example of that is the Buddha. Right? So how do we relate to the Buddha? Do we really feel that the Buddha had that insight? Do we understand that the Buddha is our teacher? Do we see the Buddha in the right way? So one of the ways of thinking about the Buddha, I'm not going to talk so much about the Buddha today, but one of the ways of thinking about the Buddha, and one of the things that I feel often is missing in our understanding of the Buddha, we kind of think of the Buddha as our teacher, but in a sense, in a very distant kind of way. Yeah, It's like he was far away two and a half thousand years ago in a different culture, which is completely different from our own. That's what we think anyway, but of course it isn't that different at all, because human beings are human beings, usually wherever they are. But the sense of distance is kind of palpable sometimes with the Buddha. So how can we bring the Buddha closer to us? This is actually a very important point. And one of the ways of doing that, one of the kind of things that I often think, or many things that I think about this, but one of the things is that, you know, when we think about something like rebirth, and we may accept that that was spoken by the Buddha, but because he's so far away, we have more doubts about the idea of rebirth. Yeah, because it seems kind of distant. Even though the Buddha is your teacher, you don't take it fully on board because of the sense of distance of the Buddha. But of course, if you have an ordinary teacher, if you go to school or you go to university here or whatever you do, and that teacher tells you something about the nature of grammar of the Sanskrit language, they tell you something about the Second World War, yeah, they tell you or the, or that Napoleon lost the war. Battle of Waterloo, whatever it is, kind of the facts, one plus one is two, or whatever you get, you get at school. Huh? Do you believe that teacher? You, normally, yes, right? You believe them. Why? Well, because surely they had no reason to lie or no reason to lead you astray. Huh? 
But when it comes to the Buddha, kind of because the Buddha feels so far away, we kind of have a different feeling with the Buddha as we have with our ordinary teachers. But of course, the reality is it should be the other way around. If you believe your ordinary teachers that you go to school with here, you should actually have far more faith in the Buddha. Because just because the Buddha was two and a half thousand years ago, just because he lived in a different culture, doesn't make him fundamentally different from your ordinary teachers. He's still a human being. He was still there. We know that the suttas, the discourse that are available today, basically were the words of this special man who lived two and a half thousand years ago. Why should we have less faith in those words uh, than we have in a teacher who is current right here and now? We shouldn't. Uh, yeah? We should look at those words in exactly the same way. Uh. So if the Buddha says that there is such a thing as rebirth, uh, we should take that as far more sure uh, than there was a battle at Waterloo uh, when Napoleon lost. Uh. Far more sure, because the Buddha is far more powerful than those historians who wrote those books. Uh. Because the Buddha's word, because someone with that kind of insight, that kind of understanding, that kind of lucidity of expression, the kind of articulateness that you find in the suttas, there's obviously someone there who is really, really special. So rebirth, far more sure than the Battle of Waterloo. You may doubt the Battle of Waterloo, don't doubt rebirth. <laughs> That's turning things upside down, right? But this is the kind of relationship we really should have with the Buddha. This is kind of how we should think about him. He's a real human being, like a real teacher of flesh and blood, exactly in the same way. There's many, many more ways that you can think about the Buddha, but uh, I, will, I will drop that for now because I've talked about this uh, more recently uh, before. Uh, but uh, then when you uh, have the Buddha, of course, from the Buddha, yeah, once you have that faith in the Buddha, from the Buddha comes the Dhamma, the teachings, uh, right? That's what you would see in the suttas. Uh, they are an expression, really, of the awakening of the Buddha. Uh, and from the Dhamma comes the Sangha, comes the Noble Sangha. Because the Noble Sangha arises because someone takes that Dhamma seriously and the practice in accord with, with, with those things. Uh. And in some ways, because the Buddha is so far away and so distant, uh, it can be hard, I, I appreciate it can be hard to relate to him in the same way as an ordinary human being. Yeah. So sometimes a shortcut to relate to both the Buddha and to relate to the awakening experience uh, can be to look at some of the people in the present day, right? Uh, people who may be noble ones, who may be superior people. Uh, and I would recommend you to do that. Uh, and one of the things that the Buddha says in the suttas, which is very kind of powerful, uh, he says that the mere sight uh, of a noble person, the mere sight of an arahant is very, very powerful and very, very important. Because when you see an arahant in the world, there's someone who's fully awakened, what you're seeing is you're seeing an alternative potential for human beings. If it's possible to be like that, well, I would like to, you know, I would like to kind of approach that ideal because this person obviously is really, really special. You see something that you don't normally see in the world. In the world, you see suffering, you see bad conduct, you see wars, you see climate change, you see all of these kind of issues that we're dealing with. Uh, but suddenly you see an opening for an alternative way of living, uh, an alternative way of being, uh, that you would never be able to see unless you actually saw that uh, awakened person. Uh, it opens up an insight into the Dhamma. It opens up a living example uh, of what the Buddha was talking about. And you can see it with your own eyes. And it can be very powerful when you see that. Uh, and of course, I had my own kind of uh, favorite, uh, you know, people who I kind of value very highly. Uh, and sometimes it can be very useful to have those kind of people in your life, uh, yeah, who kind of do things that are extraordinary. My teacher is obviously Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and usually I don't ask if uh, everyone knows Ajahn Brahm, because everyone always knows Ajahn Brahm in the assembly. Has anyone here never heard of Ajahn Brahm before? Uh, never heard of Ajahn Brahm? Okay, welcome. <laughs> That's good. Actually, one person has okay, So Ajahn Brahm. He is my teacher in Australia, yeah, and he is kind of one of the uh, kind of the, uh, he's a monk, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and he is uh, he was taught by another uh, Buddhist monk called Ajahn Shah, who was one of the kind of most famous meditation teachers in Thailand in the 20th century, and he's one of the kind of disciples of Ajahn Shah. And now he has his own monastery in Australia in Perth, and that's where I am staying. This is where Benedict Batanda has been staying before. Benedict Pekai is kind of also part of that. Um, those monasteries are down there. So anyway, so that's kind of uh, Ajahn Brahm. But Ajahn Brahm, to me, is a very kind of special kind of monk. Yeah? And uh, it's very hard to really overstate the power of some of these monks. Uh, 
And uh, sometimes it is almost like uh, when you get into the presence of someone like that, you can feel there is a sense, tangible sense of difference. Uh, I mean, I really enjoy, for example, in the monastery, when I'm kind of in my kuti, a kuti is like a hut, or we have, everyone has their own little hut in the monastery, uh, in my kuti, maybe I'm feeling that, oh, yeah, today, feeling a bit, you know, things are not going so well, my mind is a bit scattered or whatever. Yeah. And then I kind of go out at tea time, uh, I kind of go down, I see Ajahn Brahm is there, he's not always there, but when he's there, uh, actually very often he's not there, but anyway, when he's there, uh, <laughs> traveling too much, just like, yeah, just like some other people. So he... Uh, so, but when he's there, yeah, and I'm feeling a bit out of sorts, uh, I kind of go in touch on Brahma. Often I don't say anything at all. Yeah, or maybe say, oh, good evening, or, you know, how are you, whatever. I sit down. We don't talk, yeah, no need to talk. Uh, sit down next to him for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe have a cup of tea, if, you know, I feel like whatever. Uh, and then I leave. Uh, and that impact it has uh, just to sit next to someone who is very peaceful, uh, who has an aura of kindness about them, uh, is actually incredibly powerful. Uh. And this is the kind of thing that you get when you are in the presence of noble people. Uh. Yeah, I'm assuming that Ajahn Brahm is a noble one, of course, That's, you have to decide that for yourself, but that is my assumption. Uh. It's a feeling of peace, a feeling of purity, a feeling of a kind of a power, like a, something is emanating from them. Uh. And when you sit with them, you just want to hang out. Uh. You don't want to go anywhere else, right? You're so kind of happy just being there. Uh. There's something very beautiful about that, very powerful, and it reminds you of deeper qualities that are potentially there for human beings. Right? Just seeing that gives you an idea of the potential of the Dhamma. It gives an idea of what enlightenment maybe is about, at least a little bit in that direction. So this is the beauty of the Sangha, when the Sangha really works. And so this is kind of, for me, it's very simple things like that that are really powerful. Yeah? And then when you sit next to Ajahn Brahm, and kind of all the monks come out, all the monks, some of the monks may be talking, yeah. Ajahn Brahm often just sits there, yeah, he kind of doesn't say anything, yeah. a bit like a sack of potatoes, uh, you know. <laughs> 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 Don't tell Ajahn Brahm I said that about him, because he will not be happy with that one. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so he, he sits there, and often he doesn't say anything. And this is kind of this feeling about someone who is really well practiced, that it's almost as if they aren't there in a sense, uh, yeah. And this is kind of the weird thing about people who have gone a long way on the Buddhist path. The more, the longer they have gone on the path, the more ordinary they become. The more they kind of disappear into the woodwork. You wonder if they're even present. I don't know, there's a nice, very nice story. There's a book called um, uh, The Art of Disappearing, which is one of the kind of books by Ajahn Brahm. There's a story in there. I edited that book many, many years ago, so I know it quite well. There's a story in there when Ajahn Brahm was traveling around Thailand after five years as a monk. You travel usually, and you travel and you visit all of these kind of famous spiritual masters. And he mentions there meeting one very famous monk called Ajahn Tate. Yeah, and he kind of goes to his monastery and he comes to his monastery and he kind of looks around. He's very, this monk was very famous at the time. And he had this enormous hall called the Mandapa that was built by the king of Thailand, kind of in honor of this monk because he was so famous. And so Ajahn Brahm is told, okay, you have to go to this building. So Ajahn Brahm goes to this building here. He opens the door, uh, he looks inside, uh, ah, there's no one here, okay, close the door. But wait a minute, uh, he opens the door again, uh, looks inside one more time. Uh, actually, in the corner over there is a little chair, and on that sitting this old, ancient little monk sitting on this chair, looking as, as if he isn't even present, uh, right? He kind of disappeared into the woodwork. Uh, I'm not sure if they use wood, but anyway, whatever it is, the, the work of some kind, uh, it's as if he wasn't there. And Ajahn Brahm said that, uh, as he was then, when he saw him, he came to this monastery, of course, as he was traveling around Thailand, he came with all these questions in his mind. Yeah, because that's what you do when you meet all the spiritual masters, you ask questions of them and tell me the path to awakening and what am I doing wrong and give me some special teaching and all these kind of things. So he walks into the building here. He walks all the way up to this old monk sitting on his chair, hardly visible because he has disappeared kind of completely from this world. There's no sense of self there anymore. This is one of the powerful things about these people. It's as if they don't exist in a certain way. Yeah. Most people in the world, they want to say, here I am. We want to stand out somehow. Our ego demands attention to some extent. Yeah, you can see this in the world all the time. Yeah. But with some of these people, there's no sense that they don't demand any attention anymore. Yeah. And there's something very beautiful about that, something very natural, something very easy. It's very easy to feel at ease in the presence of a person like that. Yeah. 
And so Ajahn Brahm goes up to Ajahn Taita, when he bows down. Uh, and it's very easy to bow down to someone without an ego, because all that is left are all the good qualities, like the Buddha. All that is left is compassion, kindness, wisdom, peace, uh, all these beautiful things. Uh, and of course, those things are easy to bow down to. What is hard to bow down to is an ego. Uh. So Ajahn Brahm bows down to this person. Uh, but because he has completely disappeared, uh, because the field around him is so peaceful and so kind, uh, all the questions kind of disappear from Ajahn Brahm's mind. Uh. You know what it's like? You think, but suddenly you can't think anymore. You become peaceful because you are in the presence of other, another kind of peace. Uh. And so he sits down and Ajahn Tayyad says to him, Oh, welcome. Who are you? Where have you come from? Uh, what would you like to know? Uh, and he kind of feels a bit foolish. He doesn't know what to say anymore because the questions have all disappeared, right? So I don't know what I want to know. Like, what should I know, right? Oops, uh, don't knock the cops' caps down. That's what you should know. Yeah. So, so uh, and this is kind of the idea of being with someone who is special there. They kind of have a sense of disappearance. But when you, and when you speak with them, they often speak in very simple ways, uh, with a lot of kindness, a lot of peace. Uh, there's a feeling of being with someone special. The Dhamma comes alive through the very kind of presence of people like that. So to me, Ajahn Brahm is one such person. And I have known him for 30 years. And, you know, they're all saying that familiarity breeds contempt. Is that saying true? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it is true, right? Because when you get very familiar with someone, like to see all their signs, and it can very easily kind of bring a bit, contempt is kind of a strong word, but it, leads to a bit of, okay, more realistic uh, appraisal of the person, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but uh, sometimes when you meet someone very special, it has an opposite feeling. And I, I must admit that I have more confidence, more faith, more respect for Ajahn Brahm now than I have when I started out. It's been kind of growing all the time. Uh, and that's kind of quite extraordinary. Yeah. Because maybe because of my own maturing. Yeah, as you mature, you actually start to appreciate more the spiritual qualities and, and the, another person. Uh, so this is the beauty of the Sangha, yeah? the beauty of the kind of those people you think are noble ones. Yeah? Another example that I often like to bring out is the example of another monk in, in Thailand who I visited only once, but who was also very special. And he stayed at Bodhinyana Monastery for several months. His name is Ajahn Ganha. Yeah? And he is like a kind of this ocean of loving kindness. Yeah? He's a kind of incredibly kind person. Yeah? Have you been to visit him? In ah, you've been there. Okay. Good, so you, you can kind of vouch for what I say, or maybe you can disagree. I don't know what, they, what, you, what you want to do. Yeah. But uh, Ajahn Ganha is like also one of these people. You just sit down, yeah, and you kind of sit back, yeah, and you don't want to move. You're kind of very happy to be there. Yeah. And all these lay people come from around the world, from everywhere around the world, and you just sit there. Yeah. And Ajahn Ganha often doesn't say anything at all, but they're very happy just to sit there, right? Uh, Ajahn Ganha. And kind of just kind of hanging out with Ajahn Ganha for a while there, and just feeling good, yeah, feeling good about yourself. Yeah. And then Ajahn Ganha, he has this kind of, he's a very kind of uh, eccentric monk, yeah, put it that way, yeah. And he has this enormous tray of sweets, maybe one meter in diameter, and kind of this deep, full of sweets. Yeah. And then he has like a little dipper, and he dips it into the kind of this big tray, and he throws it out onto the audience. Yeah. That's what he does. And everyone kind of scrambles to get hold of the sweets. Yeah. <laughs> but it's quite... It's quite sweet, right? <laughs> and this is kind of the point. It's a very sweet gesture because uh, then you take those sweets uh, and, of course, you take them back home with you and they remind you of this occasion. So it's kind of nice, yeah? It has this kind of double meaning, sweet and sweet. Uh, so it's actually very, yeah, it's kind of beautiful. And then he kind of has this long stick. It doesn't work very well because the body is pretty much a wreck. So it has this long stick and he, he kind of puts it out on people's head and it blesses you with this long stick. Yeah. Bing, bing, bing. <laughs> this is kind of his transmission of Dhamma. That's the way he does things. So. <laughs> and there are many, many stories like that of very kind of inspiring teachers. Uh, and uh, it's kind of beautiful sometimes. When you're just being in the presence of those teachers can actually be very, very powerful. And it actually leans you towards right view. Uh, it leans you towards right view because you understand more about what the Dhamma actually is about. Uh, you see it in real life. And for that reason, it gives rise to also more faith uh, as a consequence. Uh, and of course, the, in Buddhism, uh, the idea that faith and wisdom, uh, right view and faith, uh, these things are two sides of the same coin. Uh, it's one of the, maybe the only religion in the world where that actually is the case. Yeah? Where faith is not something that is, should never really be blind. Uh, but it builds up together with wisdom. It builds up together with the right view. Huh? And that is why faith often should be 
Random is that as confidence. Uh, the Pali word is Santa. It has both sides, both confidence and faith. Uh, uh, faith is the emotional side, confidence is more the intellectual side. Uh, both of those always go together. Uh, it is one of those uh, unique things in Buddhism. So this is how we build up a sense of right view about the Dhamma. Having an understanding of the Buddha, uh, having an understanding of the Noble Sangha. Uh, and you can see a lot of this is not very intellectual. Uh, a lot of this has to do with meeting the right people, thinking about things a little bit in the right way. Uh, and as you do that, you build up this kind of feeling for what is going on there. And that feeling is what actually will make the meditation and the whole path work because we are driven by feelings, uh, motivated by feelings, uh, not really by intellectual ideas. A uh, little bit by intellectual ideas, perhaps, but it's a much weaker kind of force uh, than feelings. Uh. So this is one side of right view. I'm not going to talk that much more, but I want also want to talk a little bit about the, another side of right view and another perception that is very, very useful to develop there on the path there. And that other side of right view is the idea of impermanence, yeah, of unreliability. Yeah. And one of the things that always struck me when I was reading the suttas, one of my favorite suttas is the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Do you know that sutta? Yeah, yeah, okay. So this is the very famous sutta where uh, the Buddha's uh, passing away, yeah, where he travels from Rajagaha, the capital of Magadha, and he travels all the way to Kushinara, where he passes away, yeah. And this is a very beautiful sutta because it has a lot of Dhamma in it. It has a lot of teachings. The Buddha says, this is what you should do when I pass away. The Buddha knows that he's about to pass away. This is what you should do afterwards. And of course, because we are afterwards, these teachings are particularly relevant for us. Yeah, This is what you should do afterwards? Okay. Oh, this is what we should do then. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So a lot of things in there. For example, there is summarizing what the Dhamma is in a number of places. He gives some instructions about who should be the leader yeah, of, the, of the Sangha after he passes away. Of course, there shouldn't be a leader. He doesn't even see himself as a leader, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, but one of the most powerful things uh, is the last words of the Buddha. Uh, yeah? Because, of course, if you're going to say your last words, uh, what are they going to be? They are going to be a summary, basically, of everything uh, that you have taught, right? For 45 years or however long it was. They say 45, so we take that as a as the uh, most likely length. Uh, this is going to be a summary of everything we have taught. Uh, that is obviously what you're going to say as your last words. Uh. And so the Buddha is now coming to the very, very, very end of his life. Uh. And there's a lot of things happening towards the very end of his life. And one of the kind of interesting things that is happening, there's a monk who wants to see the Buddha. And then uh, he comes to Venerable Ananda, who is his attendant, uh, and says, oh, I'd like to see the Buddha. I'd like to ask a question. Uh. And I said, you've got to be joking, he's dying. Yeah, this is the end. You could don't come and just go ask questions of dying people like that. Imagine that you are on your deathbed, yeah, and someone says, Oh, yeah, just ask, ask you one final question you're about to draw your last breath. And you probably say, This is the wrong time, right? This is not a good time to ask a question. But the beautiful thing about the Buddha is, of course, yeah, because I'm here to serve. He doesn't actually say that, that's kind of obviously the inference here. I'm here to serve. So I will teach till the very last minute, if I can. And so, the Buddha says, allow him to come. Yeah? And then he gives him this beautiful teaching about you know, the, uh, the uh, Dhamma, or awakening is found, wherever the Noble Eightfold Path is found. Uh, that is what it teaches this monk called Subhadda, not monk, a wanderer called Subhadda. And then he practices really well. Huh? That is just before his very last words. Huh? And then the Buddha comes towards the very end of his life, huh? and he asks the Sangha, huh? yeah, the monastic Sangha, huh? Is there any questions that you may have? Uh, yeah, I'm going to die now. This is the last chance you have to ask a question. Uh, please take the opportunity. Uh, and then the Sangha is silent. Uh, and that is when the Buddha's last words come. Uh, and the last words of the Buddha are something to the effect that uh, all conditioned phenomena uh, have the nature to end. Uh, strive on with diligence. Uh, all conditioned phenomena have the nature to end. Yeah, Bhayadama Sankara is the Pali for that. Uh, and uh, that is then basically the right view of the Buddha. That is the view. All conditioned phenomena have the nature to come to an end. And then strive on with diligence. That is the path. That is a practice that we should do as a consequence of that right view. So if you want to summarize the Buddha's teachings, understanding it properly, one of the best ways of doing that is this idea that all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. And summarize, another way of summarizing the idea of right view. So this is uh, such an important thing here. 
and we should make that a kind of a mainstay of our own reflection on the on the world. If you wonder how you can practice more effectively in life, of course you should practice kindness, you should practice sila, you should purify your mind, you do all of these kind of things. But if there are times when you don't know what you should be doing with your mind, do a contemplation, do a reflection. And one of the most powerful reflections you can do is this reminder that everything in the world is impermanent, unreliable, uncertain. This is such a beautiful reflection. So when, for example, the world now is kind of going down strange ways, there's wars kind of happening, cropping up in Ukraine. So anyone here think it's a good idea to have a war in Ukraine? Nobody, right? Yeah, nobody thinks it's a good idea. So what that means, if these things are impermanent, things change, wars come. And what that means from Buddhist point of view is that nothing has gone wrong when there is a war in Ukraine. Yeah, it is not actually wrong. Yeah. It is unfortunate, it is suffering, it is a problem in many ways, but it's actually not wrong. This is the nature of the world. When there is climate change, yes, it is a problem. We should try to do something about it. We should try to fix it if we can. But nothing has really gone wrong when there's climate change in the world. Nothing has gone wrong when there's a tsunami. Nothing has gone wrong when there's all these refugees around the world. Nothing has gone wrong when the economy is tanking. Nothing has gone wrong when change happens. When you die, nothing has gone wrong. It has gone right. And this is kind of the way when an asteroid, I forgot the asteroid, when the <laughs> asteroid comes and hits the earth, bang, nothing has gone wrong yet. So this is kind of the idea, yeah, when the Buddha talks about impermanence, this is what he means. When you are trying to hold on to something, if you are watching the news on the TV or reading about it in the paper or online or whatever, and you feel a sense of despair that things are going the wrong way, it means you haven't really understood impermanence. If you, you know, watch the news or whatever, and you see there's a new war happening, okay, the U.S. has just declared war on China, yeah? Oh, yeah, I expected that. Yeah, then you have understood impermanence, yeah? It's not that you expected that specific thing, but you expected things in that ballpark, yeah? Approximately like that. You expect things to go wrong? No, right, because they've actually gone right. <laughs> So this is kind of the idea of reflecting on impermanence. And what it does, the more you reflect on impermanence, of course, the highest kind of impermanence is really death. Death kind of encapsulates all the other impermanences in our life. Because when you die, everything goes. Everything changes in one particular go. And so when you really reflect on impermanence in the right way, when you understand that the nature of the world is so problematic, what does it do? It leads to right intention. Because you want to understand the world is suffering. Understanding that uh, everything is impermanent and reliable leads to the idea of suffering. Yeah. The first factor of the noble path, noble level, is really starting to kick in. Uh. Things are uncertain. They're unreliable. Uh. It means that the world is far less interesting than we thought. Uh. Yeah, we thought the world was one way, but when we understand that, we grieve and we are sad when things go wrong in the world. We understand we had the wrong idea about the world. Uh. And so we change what do we are attached to, we change what we value in our life, and we start valuing the spiritual path far more. That valuing of the spiritual path, that's samma, sankappa, is the second factor of the Robaipo path, because our mind is turning. We have new goals, we have new purposes, we have new aims in life, which have much more to do with the inner life rather than the external life, because the inner life is something we can do something with, it's something we can develop, it's something which is within our reach to uh, to do something about. The external world, actually, there is very little we can do about as individuals. Uh, you can help a little bit, uh, but in the end, it's out of control. Uh. And so, uh, right view leads to a change in your aim, in your purpose, in your intention. Uh. You move on to the spiritual path. And once you move on to the spiritual path, of course, the first thing you want to do is to live morally. Uh. Samma Vajra, Samma Sankappa, Samma Ajiva. Right speech, right action, right livelihood. Uh. Yeah, and because we want to practice a spiritual path fully, uh, we then have the right effort, which is to overcome the negative aspects of the mind. Uh, we have more compassion for the world. Uh, we see that in an unstable world where everyone is suffering with all these problems around, there is no other solution but compassion. Uh, so we have more compassion, and then we rejoice uh, in the goodness in the world, uh, because we also see that there actually is quite a bit of goodness in the world. Uh, yeah, Buddhists uh, practice in the right way, people of other religions being kind and caring and doing good things. Uh, there is a lot of goodness in the world. So we rejoice in the goodness. Uh, at the same time, we have compassion for all the problems in this existence. Uh, 
And then when we build up these inequalities, because we, and we, we really have an understanding of the importance of the spiritual path, uh, we start to do meditation practice. Uh, and so we meditate and we purify our mind even further. Uh, we start to attain powerful states of peace and bliss, uh, and eventually entering the jhana states, uh, the deep states of samma samadhi, uh, right stillness, uh, the very last factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, all of this emerging out of right view, uh, coming from that idea that this is the right way, the spiritual practice is what matters. The world is out of control. The world is actually far less interesting uh, than what we thought it was, uh, because it is so problematic in so many ways. Uh. And then from that powerful sense of stillness that comes in the mind, uh, that is where, of course, you can the uh, insights, the understanding, uh, seeing things according to reality, yata buddha naradasara, comes from that. Uh, and that is when we kind of really, finally and fully uh, align our view uh, with the way the Buddha saw the world. Uh, that is where everything right view finally gets uh, really stabilized completely. Uh, and the right view then becomes something that never again can be lost, uh, and we carry it with us uh, until we reach the full awakening itself. Uh. So that is the uh, idea of right view for you now. So I don't know if that makes any sense at all to you, or do you think it is uh, kind of makes a little bit of sense? I'm not sure. Now. Um, I forgot to do, I mean, should, should have done a bit of meditation at the beginning, I completely forgot about that. Uh, I don't know, hope you're okay with that. Uh. <laughs> So uh, that is all I want to say, because I've already spoken for an hour. And uh, if you wish, we can now have a bit of questions and answers, a bit of discussion, or whatever you like. Um, we can even do a bit of meditation now, if you want to do some meditation now. Huh? What do people want to do? Huh? Do you have any preference? Q&A, okay. Q&A. The better one I spoke it. Yes. We'll <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, please. Um, Thank you very, very much for that talk. That was very special. Um, I felt very moved when you spoke of the Buddha's last words because just a month ago I was reading one of my favorite uh, Buddhist writers, Thich Nhat Hanh, and he said something, I mean, in the way that our kind of, our minds, in a way, really receive what they're ready to receive. I He, he wrote something like, uh, realize that the moment you started living, you also started dying. And in the seed of one's life is also contained one's death and vice versa. And it, it really gave me this very strong embodied sense of, I, I've, I mean, I've been granted this, this fleeting human existence and what, what will I do with it? And I know that I must, I know that I must fulfill my potential and whatever that is that's I mean that that will emerge and so become clear but one thing that I've found recently is how just like the the, the malleability of one's mind and almost like I think I began by conceiving the Buddha as someone far away in, in space and time and realizing that the, the, the distance is not it's not temporal. It's not spatial. It's just mental. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, and taking away those yeah. mental barriers to to yeah. bring him closer into my heart. Yeah. And I guess I I wondered that, you know, the, the the mind is so vast and the possibilities for how I approach what what feels like important states of mind to to cultivate and aligning that with whatever work I'm here to do in the world, it sometimes it, it almost seems a bit overwhelming, like the possibilities are so vast. And so do you have any words on kind of slowly cultivating a, or coming closer to that, that source within oneself of, in this lifetime, what are the gifts that I have to to offer to the world, and and how best can I become more conscious and and give them? Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, it is really about my right view, right? So this is kind of this is exactly the topic, basically. If you want to do live well, and you want to kind of get to that uh, 
motivator within you that actually makes you do the right things, be generous, be kind, all of these kind of things. It's really about understanding why these things are important. <laughs> and if you understand this in a deep way, it will always be there at the back of your mind. So it's really about contemplating the significance of these things uh, and why they really matter here. Uh. And uh, one way of thinking about that is to remember that every time you interact with someone, by speech, by action, even by thought, uh, you can actually give them a gift. Yeah, It's like giving people a gift around you. Uh, if you say something kind to somebody, it goes to their heart. Uh, and they feel really, really happy. People tend to feel happy about it. They may not show it, they may not actually see it. Uh, but very often it goes to their heart, even if they don't show it. Uh. So every time we open our mouth, we have a potential to give a gift to somebody else. Uh. And that's a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, It's kind of touching someone else in a positive way. They have a better day. They may enable them to practice their own spiritual life or whatever. And that is a marvelous way of doing something. And we can do this through our actions. We can do it through our speech. Even if we do it through our mind, actually, it is still very useful. We don't know the powers of our mind. We may connect with this person in one way or another. So uh, thinking like that already kind of helps, right? It's actually very useful. And then it's important to consider your own well-being as a consequence of doing these kind of things. And if you watch your mind very carefully, it is kind of very obvious that when you do an act of kindness that really comes from your heart, you feel good about yourself. But it's not a kind of ego good, yeah? It's a kind of quiet, peaceful sense of feeling that you're doing the right thing. It's kind of a spiritual kind of happiness and good that you, you feel about that. And what is interesting, I, you know, one of the kind of uh, famous teaching of the Buddha, of course, the teaching of kamma, yeah, the idea that you know your actions have results. Yeah, you do an act and it has a result. Uh, and the Buddha speaks of three kinds of kamma in the suttas. Uh, and one kind of kamma is called the Dittava Dhamma kamma, which means the kind of kamma which has results in this very life. Uh, and then you have Samparaika kamma, which is the next life, and then you have the, uh, the kamma which ripens beyond that. So the three kinds of ripenings and three kinds of time frames. Uh, and in many ways, the most interesting one is the one that ripens in this life. Uh, Right? Because that is something we can use straight away for our spiritual practice. And that thing that ripens in this life is precisely this. is the kind of feeling that when you do an act of kindness, you feel good straight away about that. And, you, and what is interesting is that you may think that, well, okay, you feel good, but then it kind of comes down after a while. And of course, it comes down a little bit, but it never comes down all the way to the same level it was before. It leaves a residue in your mind. And this is the point. So what you are doing, essentially, by living well and living with kindness, is as if you're allowing your mind to soar. Yeah? You're, it's, like you're, it's like a helium balloon. You're adding helium. Every act of kindness is more helium <laughs> to your mind, right? And your mind starts to soar. And when your mind soars, obviously what it means is a bright mind, a light mind, a beautiful mind. And it soars up. And the idea of soaring here is similar to the idea of samadhi, the deep meditations. Yeah. You soar up above the world, and when you soar up above the world, eventually you get the bird's eye perspective. That's where you get insight and understanding of what is going on. So make your mind soar. And remember, every time you do something which is not wholesome, not bad, you are letting some of that helium out. You're letting yourself go down, right? It's bad. You're adding sandbags to that balloon, right? And it's coming down too fast. So don't let yourself down. And uh, if you start to understand the urgency of this, because you don't know what's going to happen when you die, don't know where you're going to be reborn, don't know if Buddhism is going to be around next time around, maybe there's only going to be fools around next time, I don't know. You know? And if, you are, if there's only fools around, you will be one of them. This is the problem, right? <laughs> I will be one of them, because we are conditioned by the people around us. Uh, and so you see the urgency of this. Uh, you see the bigger picture of what is going on, and you realize, I cannot afford to make a single mistake here. You will make a single mistake. You learn to forgive yourself for those, uh, but you also understand the urgency of this. And the more you understand the urgency of this, uh, it is as if your mindfulness is programmed. Uh, mindfulness is, means two things in Pali. Sati is the Pali word. It means two things. Uh, it means the ability to be aware of what is going on, uh, and it means the memory. Uh, and so the memory in this case is like the memory of the teaching, and the memory, I should live well, I should be kind, I should treat other people well. Uh, if you understand the importance of this uh, is as if you carry that memory with you at all times. Uh, yeah? It is always there at the back of your mind, uh, always there to kind of guide you whenever you want to speak to someone, when, when you want to act towards somebody. Uh, it is a bit like the, uh, your sense of um, uh, protecting yourself yeah? is kind of always there at the back of your mind. When you're crossing the street, right, uh, you don't just walk into the street. Uh, you always check because the 
the power of that memory of knowing what you're supposed to do when you come to the street is so powerful because it has to do with your very life. Uh, actually, sila, kindness, even more important than looking into the street. Uh, yeah, even if the car comes and kind of kills you in the street, uh, that is a small thing compared to doing something immoral. It is really immoral. Uh, because if you die, okay, you get reborn, you carry on in the next life, and things kind of, there's no kind of big deal. But if you do a bad action, uh, it may lead to some very bad consequences for the long term. So actually, it's more important. We tend to uh, take death far too seriously in our Western culture. Death is not the problem. How we live, that is the real issue. That's what we should focus on. So something like that, yeah, then you may be on the right, uh, right track. But uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, hello. Uh, when, did I meet you, when did I meet you last time? In Singapore? Or? Yes, I think about yeah. two months ago. Two months ago. Well, you mentioned to me you were going to be here, right? Because I'm really glad to see you. That's great. Uh, yeah. we, we are very glad to be here. Yeah. Um, so we, we came to Oxford about two months ago. Uh, yeah. And you know, things were quite happy until I picked up this book by uh, Bhikkhu Anna. <laughs> Leo. What is that? What is that one? Uh, it's it's about early early Buddhist oral tradition. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and he did a study that said like um, uh, the actual words of Buddha can't really be uh, attributed with certainty because of, even though we we tend to believe like with uh, with a group, large group of uh, monastics uh, with the recital the actual words were actually passed that yeah. like authority and sometimes the, the passage of time that. The actual words would can't really be determined with certainty. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 yeah. was that was okay. pretty scary for me because yeah. it, it sort of uh, changed my understanding and assumptions yeah. of our tradition. I, I I know Venerable Lalu quite well actually, and I was recently in the United States and I met him when I was there and I talked to him. And so I know he's thinking actually very well. Uh, and so you have to be careful, I think, with interpreting this in the right way. Uh, I think what he probably is saying is that we don't have the verbatim word of the Buddha. Yeah. I think that is kind of his point. Uh, but I think in terms of having the ideas of the Buddha, I have no doubt that he actually agrees that we have the ideas of the Buddha. And that is what matters, right? Whether we have the verbatim word or not is not so important. Maybe you forgot a little word here, forgot a little word there. That's kind of very, very irrelevant. Uh, in fact, I know that from his uh, comparative studies of the Sutta, that's what he's famous for, his comparative studies. Uh, his argument is precisely that, you know, we can kind of fill in gaps in the Pali canon if we use these alternative suttas, you know, we can find little problems and these kind of things. Uh, so uh, I, it, I think it's important there to kind of uh, look at that with a little bit, knowing more broadly his kind of scholarship and how he thinks about these things. Uh, and he is one of the, he's a very, very de devout Buddhist and he, he uses suttas all the time for his practice. Uh, and so I have no doubt at all that he, uh, uh, you know, he takes this to be the word of the Buddha. But yes, there can be flaws sometimes in the suttas. I mean, there is there are some very good examples. There is one example in one sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya where he starts off by talking about, well, I will tell you these six things, and he only says five. So what, <laughs> what's going on, right? And then you go to the version which translated into Chinese, and that actually has six things there. Yeah, okay. And then you go to the commentary of the Pali, and then the commentary, oh, well, probably this was lost. It has exactly the same thing in the commentary that the Chinese version has in the, in the sutta, right? And this kind of thing, yeah, which kind of makes sense. So. But if you know a little bit about the history of uh, how these uh, suttas were um, spread over India in the various different schools, I think it's very hard to come to a conclusion that we don't have the word of the Buddha. The spreading started around the time of Ashoka. Ashoka is very famous for his missionary activities, uh, sending people all over India. He sent his son, Mahinda, and Sangamitta, his daughter, to Sri Lanka. Sangamitta brought the Bodhi tree to Sri Lanka, right? It is still there in Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankans should be really grateful to the nuns, right? Uh, and sometimes I mention this to Sri Lanka, the people of Sri Lanka background. I said, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, the big, This was a bikini who did that. Uh, and of course, now the bikini Sangha actually is becoming very highly established in Sri Lanka, thousands of Bikinis now in Sri Lanka, which is really, really nice. Uh, but anyway, so he sent uh, his son and daughter to Sri Lanka, and then there were other people sent to the north of India, yeah, to uh, what is now Kashmir and Gandhara and these areas. And you had the Sarvastivadan school in Kashmir, you had the Dharma school in Gandhara, and you had the Mahasanghikas probably in central India, Tiruvadans to the south, uh, and then other schools, Pugalavadan, which is a bit less uh, clearly localized there. Uh, and uh, so, 
Est-ce que t'as Sam? Sam Chamberlain Foyer. Is it? I don't know. Sam Chamberlain Foyer. 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 Sam Essentially, the school really started from that point of view. And because we know that, we know that the uh, Theravada collection started in Sri Lanka roughly then, the Samastivadan collection started in India roughly then. So that's when they had separate transmissions starting from around the time of Ashoka, and a little bit later, but roughly around then. And uh, that was uh, 2000, almost 2,300 years ago, the time back to the Buddha, another hundred. 150 years, yeah, not very far, depending on how you calculate the, uh, the, the time of the Buddha passing away. There's kind of a lot of arguments about that. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, and then when you compare the Pali with what is now in Chinese translation, because it was translated to Chinese when it entered China, you compare them and the astonishing similarity between the suttas, yeah, it's like almost you have the same sutta. They are a few, they're not verbatim the same, but the ideas are exactly the same. Not the noble eightfold path, the four noble truths, the ten origination, the five khandas, the five hindus, the six sense faculties, uh, the thirty-seven body pakyanamas. Uh, yeah, all of these things are there and are explained almost in exactly the same way. The noble eightfold path, the uh, first, the jhanas are sama samadhi. If you look at the actual description of sama samadhi, uh, it is almost exactly verbatim the same. Two of them are verbatim the same, but one of them has some slight difference, which doesn't really make any difference for the meaning. Uh, and you see that even verbatim, some of these things have obviously been uh, uh, been uh, kept yeah, verbatim after all, after all of those years. So once you see that, and this was still in the oral period at that time, so the oral transmission must have been very precise as well, because that was still in that period. I think it's impossible to argue that, that this is not the word of the Buddha. 150 years earlier comes the time of the Buddha, if they were so conservative to really look after these things so well, where did that conservatism come from? It must have come from the very earliest period, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be conservative later on. If they were not conservative at the beginning, they wouldn't be conservative later. So that conservatism must have been built into the tradition from the beginning. And sure enough, if you read the suttas, the Buddha talks precisely about how they should ensure that the word of the Buddha is kept for future generations. It talks about reciting things together, uh, asking about the meaning, and kind of finding out the problems that are there in these things. Uh, so I cannot see any kind of rational grounds for not thinking that we don't have the word of the Buddha. I think we still have the word of the Buddha. Not verbatim, but more than close enough uh, to be able to practice these teachings properly. Uh, yeah. Are you reassured? Uh? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bad idea that that's kind of a scary moment there for a second. You know? <laughs> so that's, that's the way I see it. So, uh, yeah. All right, anyone else would like to say anything? Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering what, why, yeah. like, you know, about reincarnation and all that, yeah. and rebirth. Like, why, why isn't everybody, like, believing in that? And I wonder the same, you know. I have no <laughs> idea. I find it really weird. Not, not everyone believes in that. I find it very strange. Yeah. I think the idea is just conditioning. We are conditioned in different ways, and when you get conditioned in a certain way, then you don't believe in it. That's really the answer. It's not, we don't believe in things because it's rational. We believe in things because we are conditioned, because it's emotional for us, because we, our mind is pointing in a certain direction. That's really the reason. And so you have been conditioned in a certain way, and that's actually very useful to know, because it means that you look at things more carefully. Yeah? If you know that you're conditioned, uh, you start to think, well, wait a minute, am I believing in this because of habit uh, or is it because of real reasons for believing in this? Uh, and I always had this feeling that I, I always wondered, why did I become a monk? Yeah, that's kind of weird. I was born in Norway. Uh, yeah, there's no Buddhist around. Norway. I don't really know a single Buddhist when I grew up. Uh, everyone looked exactly like me. There was no immigration in Norway in those days. Uh, kind of, we all looked exactly the same. Uh, we were all atheists, uh, yeah, didn't believe in anything at all, except for material goods, of course, and those kind of things. Uh, and, uh, and somehow, I made it into these robes. Uh, and if you ask me exactly how that happens, I would, if you asked me 20 years ago, 25 or 30 years ago, 
I would have said because I'm very smart. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I see the path. When I see the path, I know this is the path. Yeah. I, I don't kind of I'm not fooled easily. Yeah. So <laughs> it's kind of conceit, right? And this is kind of the thing. But the more I kind of look back now, after being a monk for almost 30 years, I, I look back and I realize actually the problem wasn't much choice. I was kind of driven towards this, kind of inexorably. The, all the things just fell into place and I became a monk. Yeah. And yes, I was conceited to think that I was very smart and very kind of, you know, astute and wise or whatever. But actually, probably nothing to do with smart at all. I think the reason I'm a monk yeah, is because of habit. I was a monk in the past life, and I'm a monk in this life. So I created a habit in the past life. I follow the same habit in this life. Yeah. And that's kind of interesting for me, because once I realize, actually, probably this is a habit, uh, it kind of becomes concerning, yeah. At that moment, you realize, actually, I better read this teaching because if it is a habit, and I'm just a monk because, you know, <laughs> following kind of certain inclinations in my mind, I better make sure that I have made a good choice. So let me read these teachings. Does what the Buddha said make sense? And fortunately, you know, it actually made good sense. So I kind of carried on being a monk. Yeah. And this is kind of this idea of conditioning. Yeah. You start to doubt yourself. You start to kind of question things in a new way. Yeah. So if you believe in rebirth, for me also, very, very easy to believe in rebirth. I had never any problems with that at all. But that is precisely maybe why I should question it, right? And once I start to question it, my faith got even stronger because I realized actually there's no reason at all not to believe in it. There's like some very good reasons to believe in it. But uh, uh, this is kind of the right approach. And I wish that more people who also, uh, you know, who are... Uh, kind of don't believe in rebirth, that they actually would have a similar kind of attitude sometimes, be more open-minded about these things. I'm sure many of them are, uh, but some of them are not. Uh, and uh, I think the more we kind of look at the history of the world and we start to see uh, uh, different uh, philosophical attitudes, especially in the Western world, uh, we start to realize that the idea that there is no rebirth uh, is really just a modern view in the Western world. Uh, yeah, it's just a view that we've had over the last century or so. But actually, it is not, it is a fashion. Yeah, these views come in into fashion and they go out of fashion again after a while. But it's not as solid as we think it is. Yeah, we all, always have this tendency to think that we are moving in a certain direction. We're becoming wiser, we understand more about the world. And then when you take more of a bird's eye view, you look more at history in a broader kind of sense. You realize that these ideas of a, you know, sometimes idealism, idealism is the idea that mind is kind of primary, material phenomena are secondary, versus materialism or physicalism, where the physical world is primary, the mind is secondary. This kind of goes in waves, and sometimes one of these is in, is in the ascendancy, and then, the, and then that goes down, and the other one becomes in the ascendancy, right? So, for example, if you go back to the 19th century, idealism, the idea that mind is primary, was a very uh, important uh, philosophical direction in Germany. And they had a ger famous German idealist, uh, some of the very famous philosophers at the time, like Kant, uh, Hegel, and this, this Schopenhauer, or whatever, they were all idealists. Uh, and then that went out of fashion because uh, certain other philosophers kind of criticized, like Bertrand Russell was actually one of them who criticized these people. Uh, so Bertrand Russell has some of the blame that we don't believe in rebirth, maybe, I don't know. He was probably a great philosopher in many ways, but. Uh, like everyone, he probably made some mistakes. And then now, what we're seeing now in Western philosophy again, the idea of rebirth is creeping back in again. Not rebirth, but rather the idea that the mind is a primary uh, aspect of existence. It's kind of gradually coming back in again. So the pendulum is swinging back, right? And then you start to realize, actually, these are just philosophical fashions. And if these are just philosophical fashions, how much weight should we lend to these things? These are not scientific truths. This is a particular interpretation of the scientific data as it has arrived to us. And that is when I say, well, if these are just philosophical fashions, I'll go with the Buddha. Because <laughs> the Buddha is kind of beyond all of these philosophical fashions. He has kind of a higher bird's eye view. He sees reality from a completely different point of view. If he says there is rebirth, I have every reason to think there is rebirth. People think that the word of the Buddha is not important, there's not really evidence for rebirth. Actually, the word of the Buddha is the highest evidence for rebirth. Yeah, for me, that's all I need. The Buddha said that, there must be rebirth. And that is kind of um, a different way of 
thinking about it. But anyway, so things are always changing in the world. Things are moving around. When people say that the science has proved that there is no rebirth, it's complete. science hasn't proved any such thing at all. In fact, it's now going in the opposite direction. People are saying that the mind cannot be explained as an outcome of material phenomena. If the mind cannot be explained as an outcome of physical phenomena, we have a serious problem because the one thing that we do know is that there is a mind. If it wasn't the mind, you wouldn't be able to listen to this talk, right? That kind of this is presuppos the mind is presupposing any kind of knowledge, any kind of understanding. It is prior any kind of physical phenomena in the world, all these kind of things. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, anyway, that's my answer. Are you okay with that? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, please feel free to come back if you wish, but. Uh, <laughs> Okay, please. Yeah. Um, so, like the on the subject of rebirth, so like the Buddha said um, that my teachings are like a, a finger pointing at the moon, um, and they're not the moon itself. So, he speaks about rebirth, but it's kind of it's with my own eyes that I must see it in my experience of the world, and t I mean to me, I feel like I. Not approaching it through the lens of do I believe in it or not, but just simply how do I see it. I've tried to open my, you know, growing up in the UK, um, it's not something spoken about. So I've tried to cultivate a mind that's open to seeing it. And I guess the way in which I've, I've maybe tasted glimmers of it is, for example, seeing how behavioral patterns pass down through family members over the generations or also just in my own life, right from childhood, having certain inclinations, where did they come from? And so do you have any suggestions for how to begin to investigate or see rebirth? I mean, there's lots of things you can do. You can uh, read some of the books on the event experience, for example. There's a book recently released called After, by a, a very famous researcher on the that he called the Bruce Grayson uh, at the University of Virginia in the United States, uh, and uh, this is a kind of a real, uh, you know, part of a very well-known university. So this is kind of proper research and things. And that book is very interesting. It talks about people having near death experiences, and then he goes through the evidence and he looks at it, tries to explain it in like kind of traditional scientific terms, uh, and he kind of comes up, you know, saying that basically it cannot really be fully explained in ordinary scientific terms. And it's very interesting when you start to hear some of these experiences that people have, it's very hard to dismiss it, actually. Very, very difficult. These are ordinary people having these kind of experiences, and it starts to kind of feel like there must be some truth to this. And there is actually, the more you look at it, the more evidence there is. One book that was released in, I think, 2007 was called Irreducible Mind. An irreducible mind is the idea that the mind is not reducible to material phenomena, right? The mind is kind of itself a fundamental aspect of reality. And this is a large book, 700 pages, tiny font, yeah, just really small, lots to read. And it's all about the evidence that exists that the mind is more than material phenomena. Some of the evidence is very interesting. One of the evidence they point out there is the idea that many people who are demented when they die, just before they die, maybe 15 minutes before, they regain their senses. Yeah, and they kind of look up and say, oh, son and daughter, I have, you know, where have you been the last 20 years? Yeah, it's Actually, you were the one who were demented. So <laughs> but, and that's weird, right? And that is very hard to explain from an ordinary materialist point of view, because if the brain really is damaged, how can the consciousness kind of recognize someone if that damage is there? From a Buddhist point of view, actually quite easy to explain, because at this point, the mind is kind of, the body is kind of being left behind, the other coarse body, and the mind is kind of move, already starting to move on, so it's starting to release itself from that sick body, and so it regains the faculty of consciousness, and is able to recognize people. And that's kind of nice as well, because, you know, people are so sad when they get demented, but it's only a short-term problem. As soon as you die, you are released from that, and you're kind of back in business again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, which is kind of hopeful and nice, yeah. So uh, there are lots of evidence like that, uh, and uh, one another one very famous one is a, a doctor called Dr. Ian Stevens, who kind of did the uh, research into the recollection that children recall in past lives. Uh, he was very famous, he studied that for 50 years or something, he died quite recently, uh, 
and uh, very interesting. Some of those things that happened that he talks about, very, very interesting. Yeah. One example was a, a young boy, I think it was, who, who was born without fingers on one hand, right? He had no fingers on one hand. And on top of that, uh, he had a memory of being a farmer uh, who had lost all his fingers in some kind of farm equipment, right? He said, oh, in the past life, I was this farmer. I lost all my fingers in the farm equipment. Uh, and uh, so they then try to figure out, oh, I, I lived in such and such a place, I was such and such a person, or whatever. And so they kind of go, and they're trying to figure out, and sure enough, there was a farmer, yeah, in the kind of nearby, uh, who actually lost all his finger in an accident. And he remembered being that person. And there wasn't really any convincing evidence that he would have known that in any other way, right? And apart from memory. Yeah. And so these kind of things, and apparently this kind of birth defect, you have no fingers, is extremely rare. It's like one in a million or something, like it's born without fingers, right? It's very, very rare. And so the statistical chance of being by accident is very, is negligible. Yeah. And uh, so there's lots of evidence like that, which is very interesting. But to me, the most powerful evidence, again, is number one that the Buddha said there is. That's, for me, plenty sufficient. Uh, the other one is when you start to understand that actually uh, uh, this kind of Western idea, uh, Western philosophy that science somehow has proven that, that there is no rebirth, actually that is going to stay myth. Yeah, It turns out to be completely wrong yeah, because science has shown no such thing at all. Yeah. In fact, uh, the, uh, the idea of whether there's rebirth or not is just a particular interpretation of the data. Yeah. And we are kind of, basically, I think we have interpreted it completely wrong. Because there is no, as many philosophers would say, there's no way even in principle uh, that we can show how the mind can possibly emerge from material phenomena. Uh, because they're two completely different things. Uh, how can something completely different emerge from something completely different? Uh, a mind, a consciousness, has no, nothing at all in common with material phenomena. Uh, and so there's no way in principle we can show that these things can emerge from each other. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful argument. Uh, there's lots of evidence. I, I you know. Uh, Anyway, so check it out, yeah, and maybe you can, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe you can go astral traveling. That's not a possibility, yeah. <laughs> this is one of the, you can actually get this book, so this guide on how to go astral traveling, yeah. And so you kind of do lucid dreaming and you kind of leave your body and that kind of stuff. That's not a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I think at the back there, first of all, you were, yeah, please. Oh, thank you. Um... I used to love coming here for meditation, and then COVID happened, and I was fortunate enough to discover that I could do Sri Ratna meditation, Buddhist meditation, um, on Zoom, which I did, and I still am doing, um, and it's an hour long every morning, and most mornings I, I manage to do it. Um, and what concerns me, or what puzzles me, is that at times, really frequently and probably daily, um, I can go for ages. Is it pre retina I don't know whether you know, but it's got different stages, like four different stages in it. Um, there are two types um, of, of pre retina But I can go, and it's broken down into segments, and I can go for such a long time, completely up with the fairies, and then suddenly think, oh God, I'm supposed to be meditating. And I'm sure that happens to many, many people, of probably course, yeah. everyone. Yeah. And this may sound rather materialistic, <laughs> but I wonder what good I'm getting, what benefit there is, if in, although you're physically sitting there, yeah. your mind has gone <laughs> walk about. Okay. Yeah, good question. <laughs> so the, uh, the answer is that what you should do really you should always evaluate your meditation at the end yeah you should ask yourself how do i feel now after the meditation and uh, ideally you should always feel better at the end than when you started uh, so you should feel more peaceful more at ease you should have more sense of uh, uh, being able to deal with the vicissitudes of life when you come out you have more time for other people more ability to treat them with kindness that is what you should get out of the meditation uh, there should be a change if there is no change uh, nothing is happening it's pointless so look at whether you're having results or not. That is the critical thing. Yeah. It may be that an hour is too long. Yeah. yeah, an hour is a long time. I mean, you have to be fairly skilled meditator to sit for a full hour. Yeah. Maybe you should shorten it down. Listen to the first 20 minutes of the true Ratana meditation, right? And then turn it off or whatever. Do whatever works for you. Don't follow the program too blindly is what I would recommend. 
the most important thing to enable meditation practice is uh, uh, virtue, kindness. Yeah, see, like all the Pali language, uh, be as kind as you can. If you are really, really kind, your meditation is going to improve. I guarantee it. Uh, the other thing I talked about today is right view. That also improves the meditation because it guides your mind in the right direction. If you have the right view, you know where to find happiness. So the mind will chuck out all the nonsense by itself because it knows where to find it. So chuck out the nonsense, right? <laughs> and uh, so this is the two things that you can use in the long run to improve your ability to meditate. Be super duper kind uh, and try to uh, get more straight view about what the Dhamma is about. Uh, then, even if a meditation isn't going so well now, in the long run, it will come on track again. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Someone else want to say, yeah, please, sir? Uh, I'm interested you mentioned uh, lucid dreaming and astral travel. <laughs> <laughs> I had a strange experience a while ago where I'm quite familiar with lucid dreaming. It's something I've often done without meaning to. Yeah. And I had a strange experience that was like a lucid dream, but much more real. Mm -hmm. And I... I don't entirely believe, but I strongly suspect that my mind left my body. And I'm wondering if the Buddha made any comment on that kind of thing, or if there are any practices in Buddhism that use that kind of thing. He did, and uh, he, he says, <coughs> one of the kind of passages he talks about that, he talks about the idea of actually leaving your body. And he says it's a bit like a straw, right? When you have a straw, you can pull the inner straw out of the outer straw. It's like a sheath almost. And or it says it's like a snake, where the snake kind of comes out of its kind of ordinary you know, the skin, the old skin kind of gets shed there, and the snake comes out of its old skin there. And so, the, uh, so what the Buddha is saying, and then he says that uh, you are ahin indriya, you're not deficient in faculties. Uh, and so in other words, when you come out of your body, you still have your faculties, right? You can still, and this is probably what you found as well, you can still see, you can still hear, all those things are still there, even though you haven't got your physical body there. So that's what that shows, is that uh, the way, there is not an absolute distinction between the material side of the world and the mental side of the world. Uh, the material side of the world comes in many refinements, right? Uh, so you kind of come out of your body, actually the material world is still there, it's just a more refined version, not as heavy as this body, uh, but more refined than this body. Uh. So the Buddha says, yes, it can be done, uh, and actually it can be done uh, through, you know, the use in the mind in the right way. Uh, is one of the kind of the psychic powers you can kind of develop is kind of pulling yourself out of the body and go back in again. And so that's possible. And then you can probably go astral traveling or whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure if that's a Buddhist term, but actually it is the Buddhist term, obviously. Yeah. But you can kind of mess around. Yeah, you can kind of go to the, I don't know where you want to go, Andromeda Galaxy or whatever. You can <laughs> have a good time. And uh, the Buddha says you can go as far as the Brahma world, yeah, that will be with the astral bodies. You can go to different realms, yeah, not just the human realm. That's kind of cool, yeah. And you can stroke the moon and the sun, he says. And you can stroke the moon and the sun a little bit and stroke, stroke it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so there are things. So he does talk about it, but it's not really a core aspect of Buddhist spiritual practice. Yeah? This is more like a epiphenomena, I think they call it. Yeah? It's kind of something that happens in addition, uh, but not really something that we deliberately uh, would want to do because it actually doesn't really lead anywhere apart from having a bit of fun. And it's okay to have a bit of fun, of course. Uh, but that's not the main point of the spiritual practice. Uh, a bit of entertainment is fine, but uh, you know, know the bounds of entertainment. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Sir. First of all, it's really nice to have you here. So, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, I can. Well, I'm very far from being enlightened, of course. <laughs> whoever, whoever knows me, <laughs> will say that. But. Um, I see that, like with practice, going back to the art of disappearing, yeah. that we talked about, you know, as the yeah. we transcend the three poisons more and more. You know, and I see people have been practicing for a long time. They, you know, the practice works. Yeah, it does work. So if you follow the instructions and you do that, uh, it works. But then the like, but also I see in my experience, the more I practice, the more I care about yeah. the world, uh, the environment, yeah. Yeah. everybody. Good, yeah. So that's good, right? Good, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely good, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then, but then yeah. I see that the, like, the final goal yeah. in uh, Buddhism is to get out of this cycle yeah. of rebirth. And I can understand like the rebirth of all the bad stuff. 
stuff in the mind, you know, yeah. but then yeah. there's an action, and this and there's an action, end of, yeah. I don't want to say end of life, yeah. and you can get out the whole way. Yeah. Uh, but it kind of, the more I practice, the more sad that makes me. Like, <laughs> I care, okay, I, I care okay. more and more, and then yeah. I say, bye. Yeah, okay, you see what I mean? The, I the, the reason, clearly they do it. The, the, the reason you are sad about it is because you're here. If you weren't here, you wouldn't be sad about it. So the sadness comes because you were reborn. If you weren't reborn, you would not be sad about it, right? So one of, one of the great things about uh, one of the great things about uh, kind of making an end of everything and practicing the path all the way to the end is that you bring other people with you. You're not the only one. Yeah, other people get taken along because they see you, they get inspired by your example, that, and they also get a chance to make an end of all the problems. Huh? So actually, it's a wonderful thing. Otherwise, they also would be trapped. They would continue going round and round and round, experience that thing. The thing is that, you know, okay, there's climate change now. There's been climate change in the past. Yeah? And before that again, uh, we've been doing all these things so many times already. Yeah? And the point is that the point of view of Buddhism is this bird's eye view point of view. Uh, bird's eye view. We always say is this tiny little slice of existence, and that is the present life that we have now, whereas in reality, existence is this enormous thing, yeah? and because we only see a tiny slice of reality, we're very biased in the way we think about the world. Yeah? The world actually is this enormous thing, yeah? and once you see that, and this is what the Buddha saw, and I think that is what drove him to make an end of everything, yeah? he saw his past lives, he realized what was going on, okay, this is too much, I'm going to get out of this as soon as possible. Yeah? So the idea is, it's much better, yes, we can we should help help the world. We should do good things to the world. We should try to help everyone. It's our moral duty, and I think we will uh, have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of support for our practice if we do that in the right way. So it's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, but we should also know that that actually there is no real solution there uh, because actually the problems tend to recur. Uh, we never know how we, effective we're going to be with those things. Uh, things just go on and on and on. The same thing that you've died how many times before. Uh, because all we're doing is filling the graveyards. The graveyards are almost full. <laughs> so there's no room of room for you in the graveyard, right? There's, there's probably a graveyard space these days, yeah? so you've got, be, you've got to be careful. So if you, so uh, <laughs> there is a, there, there are some very serious problems with this, uh, and it's the understanding that the world is not solvable. Uh, yeah, there is no solution in the world. Uh, there's just more of the same, and because there is no solution, there is nowhere to really go. There is no point, there is no, there's nothing, you know, it's just going around, it's more of the same, basically. The solution is on the spiritual path, not in the world. And that is kind of the message of the Buddha. And uh, that is why we should do our best, but we should not um, place all our bets on sorting out the world. Because if you place all the bets on that, you're going to get very, very depressed, a very, very sad person. <laughs> yeah. Instead, we should go somewhere where there actually is a solution. Take as many with you as you can. It's not sad, it's actually incredibly happy. All that you're doing, is you're ending suffering. Yeah? Only one thing ends, that's suffering. Nothing else ends. Yeah? That is kind of the beautiful thing about this. Yeah? The problem is you think that other things are ending as well, but actually they're not. All that is ending is suffering. Yeah? All you're doing is taking some suffering out of the world. That's all you're doing. If you end it, it means that at least some suffering is taken out of the world. Yeah? <coughs> all the suffering remains, but that is that one suffering is gone. Isn't that great? Yeah? If you can reduce suffering in the world, yeah? This is the final, ultimate reduction of suffering in the world is disappearing from the world. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, there you are here. Yeah. You didn't look entirely content with that reply, but anyway, you just... Uh, you think, think of, please, think of that. Think of that. That's really good. That, yeah. That's good. Huh? Please, my devil. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, yeah, a very good uh, Bali translation, so, and you have uh, translation like the Yoni Soman Sikara, and Yetha Buddha Nyana Dasana, and Dekha Dhamma Vidaniya. All the kinds of you, uh, your translation is very perfect. So, I would like to know the three things, very, very simple. Mm. One is uh, how long. How you study Pali and ah, okay. where, where do you study Pali? Yeah, okay. And then yeah. because uh, some people they say Pali is very difficult to study. Mm. And then the next one, the last one is Yoni uh, Somnesikara and Upeka. Upeka? Yeah, yeah. 
when we sitting meditation, someone say, uh, you have to focus, uh, you have to pre- point your mind in in the way of the yoni somna sikara, yeah. and sometimes they said in the pain, for when we encounter the pain, yeah. uh, sukha, dukkha, and ubeka in the, the ubeka, you should follow this ubeka. So, I like to do the do the link to each other and okay, yoni yeah. somna sikara and uh, ubeka. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, the first thing, how long have I studied Pali? Quite a long time, actually. Yeah. I started when I be- just be- before I became a monk, when I was at a Garika, just wearing white. Yeah? I, Ajahn Brahm was my teacher. Yeah? How did Ajahn Brahm learn Pali? By reading a book about Pali. Yeah? A.K. Water's Introduction to Pali. He read that one. Because A.K. Water, right? And so he learned Pali that way. So he, basically, Ajahn Brahm is self taught. Yeah? There's a fancy word for that autodidact. It's self taught. It's kind of a nice word. Yeah? And um, so he, he taught me Pali originally, and uh, so I learned from him, and from that I just carried on learning Pali. Uh, so I've been kind of doing this for a long time, uh, and uh, I, I have recently translated, actually, translated the Vinaya Pitika. If you want to read, you can read it online, available online, uh, and it will be published soon as well. Uh, so uh, quite a while, yeah, and I'm a pretty slow learner, it took me a long time to kind of get this, but gradually, gradually it kind of happens. It's true, right? I don't consider myself very, very far, they're not kind of, it's not kind of some kind of humble brag, it's actually the truth. So. Uh, and, but of course, your ability to learn these things will depend on so many factors, when, what your proclivities are, your abilities are, and all these kind of things. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, and also depends on your interest. I found for myself, the reason I think I was able to learn Pali not, wasn't that hard, uh, was because I was suddenly very interested, right? This is the Dhamma of the Buddha. I really wanted to learn Pali. Uh, I really, if I'm going to be a monk for a long time into the future, I want to have a really solid foundation. I want to be able to read the suttas for myself. Uh, I don't want to have to rely on some dodgy translator. Uh, <laughs> sure, I had good faith in certain translators. You know, I, I'm just messing around a little bit. But sometimes you just don't know, right, when they get it right. Uh, and then after a while, you start criticizing these translators. Yeah, that's when you have fun. So I go to Adam Ram and say, Adam Ram, listen, you got this wrong. Yeah, that's when you're having fun and arguments and things like that. And after Adam Ram, he gets really fed up with you when you ask him many questions. But that's a, that's kind of part of the part of the fun, right? Of being a, of being a student or someone. You have to challenge them a little bit. Otherwise, you're not doing your job as a student. That's what I recommend. <laughs> So, uh, and so this is how I kind of learned uh, how basically I came about these things. Uh, and so, Yonisoma de Sikara and Upeka, I would say that Upeka is a kind of Yonisoma de Sikara. It actually is Yonisoma de Sikara. Because if you have a, a Upeka on, on something, yeah, uh, you are, the, the lower kind of Upeka is like sense restraint, uh, not allow the senses to kind of like or dislike things, yeah, but you have upeka when you see the world. Uh, so your mind is kind of even. Uh, that is a kind of yonasamana sikara because you're looking at the world with the right kind of intention, with the right kind of attitude. Uh, yoniso, yoni boom, yeah, manasikara, attention, the action of the mind, manasikara, action of the mind, attention, uh, going to the source or something like that. Or I think wise attention is a nice way of putting it there. Uh, so I, I would say it is a kind of wise attention. If it is the real upeka, it has to be the real upeka. If it's dodgy upeka, then it might be ayonis or manasika. But if it's a kind of good upeka, then you're actually, it is, a, it is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Are you happy with that? Or, yeah? Yeah? Okay, good. You're allowed to, you know, come back. You, because I have not a bad comeback with arguing so much about the Ram. I can expect other people to argue with me. So you're welcome to argue with me back. Yeah, just do it. I'm just waiting for that camera to write the night list on that. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Please, uh, yeah. Um, I'm reading a lot of studies about the rebirth, so I'm aware that you can get stuck between realms before you decide. Mm. But my question is from the Buddhist perspective, what actually happens to you when you get enlightened? Do you literally completely disappear? or? When you get enlightened, yes. when you become an arahant, yes, uh, or when you d- or when the arahant dies. No, so basically, so if you don't get rebirth, yeah, your subconscious, where where does that go then? Where does it go? Okay, mm-hmm. so go to dependent origination, right? That's, that's a very useful place to go. Right? So according to dependent origination, you have the origination mode, which starts with avijja, ignorance, avijja, pacha, sankara. Uh, avijja is the cause for sankaras, which is. Uh, 
willed activities, and yeah, willed activities are the cause for vijnana consciousness. Uh, the cause vijnana, uh, vijnana pachya namarupa consciousness is the cause or condition for namarupa, which is like name and form or something like that. Uh, yeah, that is the origination sequence. So if you practice the path fully, if you have right view, it means you have abandoned avijja, you abandon ignorance at the beginning. So when ignorance is gone, then uh, that ceases. It means that because avinja is the cause for willed activities, uh, when avinja is gone, willed activities, sankara, must also go. Yeah. Uh, what, how does it go? Uh, avinja, niroda, uh, avinja, sankara, niroda, or something like that. Uh, and when sankaras are gone, according to pen origination, yeah, from the cessation of sankaras, vinyana comes to an end. Consciousness disappears, yeah? So if consciousness disappears, then Namarupa disappears. Yeah? Namarupa is the translated as individual differentiation, is one my, my, my favorite translation right now. Right? It's kind of nice, isn't it? Do you like that one? I don't feel like it, but uh, that's what I like. Because you become differentiated as an individual. What makes an individual? Name and form makes you into who you are. Anyway, it's just a crazy, crazy <laughs> idea. But um, so all of that ceases, uh, yeah? Contact ceases, uh, feeling ceases, the whole sequence goes, you don't get reborn. Uh, so consciousness ceases according to the cessation sequence. Yeah? And what does it mean that consciousness ceases? It basically means that suffering is ceasing. All that is ceasing is suffering. Yeah? Nothing else. Uh, and that is kind of the critical point of this thing. Yeah? We think that there's something more ceasing. That is why we don't like this kind of teachings. Uh, but actually, the only thing that goes is suffering. Yeah? And if consciousness does not cease, uh, suffering does not cease. So that's actually required for suffering to cease. Nothing else disappears except suffering. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Please, sir. Yeah. Um, do you think the Buddha said, uh, be a light oh. unto yourself or be an island to yourself? Aha, okay. So, uh, yeah, be a light unto be. So, this is the word deeper, whether it means light or it means. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think maybe. I think. Good question. I think that the usual, I think there is a, the usual understanding is an island, I think, in that context. Uh, I think that is a usual one. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, because I think the idea, remember the context here, uh, is the idea of refuge. Uh, yeah? The idea is that Buddha is about to die, uh, and uh, Ananda is kind of saying, oh no, the directions are unclear, and I can't remember the teachings. Uh, yeah, I was getting really confused, I'm really concerned. Uh, and it's kind of sweet in a way. Yeah? You can see that people are really sweet and, and a bit sad at the same time. Uh, like much of life can be sometimes. And so he is despairing. And the Buddha, that is where the Buddha says, Yeah, haven't I told you all things are impermanent? Yeah, there's nothing you can hold on to in the world. And then he says, Be a lamp or an island. Well, I think an island works well there because island is kind of separated. Yeah, it's out. It is its own ref like being refuge for yourself, being an island unto yourself. Uh, is the idea of being separated from the world. Uh, so it fits well with the idea of refuge. Uh, so I think that is more likely. Being light under them is more like be wise, yeah, mm -hmm. be kind of have a light for yourself. Yeah. So I would say that to me it seems more likely. Mm -hmm. But the interesting things about the teaching of the Buddha is that sometimes a statement can have many different meanings, right? It doesn't have one specific meaning. Yeah. That all kind is fascinating. I, there's a place in the Buddha Nikaya where the Buddha, uh, a monk goes to the Buddha, or actually, no, no it's a, many monks together and they have a cryptic verse. Uh, and each monk has a different interpretation of this cryptic verse. And they go to the Buddha and they say to them, which one of us is right? And the Buddha says, you're all right, yeah? And here is another interpretation for you. <laughs> <laughs> right? And that's kind of cool. It means that, when, especially when we have inspirational sayings or verses and these kind of things, often they can have a number of different meanings. We shouldn't think that there's only one right meaning. However, this is a big however, there are many, many wrong meanings, right? Just because there are many interpretations doesn't mean that there aren't wrong interpretations. Sure, there are wrong interpretations, and it's not up to us to interpret it any which way we want to. Uh, it still has to kind of fall within the acceptable Buddhist uh, kind of limits, otherwise we have a problem. Please, uh, yeah. Um, so there was um, online dhammas uh, were, were mentioned a bit earlier, and um, as yourself, you probably travel through among, uh, among lots of sanghas, and now we've been given the opportunity to travel to different sanghas through, through online uh, means. Yeah. Um, what would be your advice about listening to different, um, li listening in different sanghas? 
Okay. All right. I think that's a very, I think, very important question, actually, and I think that's something that we should maybe ask more often. Uh, I would say that uh, it's good to have a little bit of different listening in the beginning. Yeah, you get to, get to hear what different people say, and you get an understanding of where to have your faith and where to have your confidence, and who seems to speak in accordance with the Buddha. If you want to decide who is speaking what, it should always be compared to the word of the Buddha. The word of the Buddha is the gold standard, right? Uh, you should ask, is it according to the word of the Buddha? Then you are on the, on the right track. Yeah. But then there comes a point where I would not recommend to listen to too many teachers. Yeah? Once you have kind of a few teachers who you really respect and you feel are teaching the right way, stick to them. Uh, because otherwise it just gets too confusing, too many conflating ideas, too many, too many things going on. Uh, and uh, get inspired where you feel there is a real inspiration to be had. Uh, one of the things I really uh, stood out, I remember in the sutta to me, was uh, I think it's in the uh, Mahasunyata Sutta, the long sutta, longer sutta on the uh, emptiness. Uh, and the way Venerable Ananda said something to the Buddha, oh, please give us a teaching or something. And the Buddha says, You had enough teachings. <laughs> it doesn't say it exactly like that. What it says is that, Why do you ask for more teachings? You've got so many teachings already in there. And uh, the idea there, and this goes on after, if you are to hear teachings or if you are to discuss the Dhamma, it should be things that give rise to energy, yeah? Yeah? things that give rise to wisdom, things that give rise to samadhi. So the idea seems to be that the teaching should be inspirational, right? Uh, so there's two reasons for uh, listening to teaching. One is for understanding the basics of the Dhamma, the other one is to be inspired. Uh, yeah, and it comes a point when you understand enough, and this is what the Buddha makes his point here. You know enough Dhamma, he said to another. You know everything already. Who cares about all this knowledge? Now is the time to get inspired. And that is the same thing with each one of us. There comes a point when there are certain teachers you find are inspiring and are really useful, and you feel have the right view, right? Go there to kind of go to the well to drink from those people, because that is where you will find the satisfaction that works for you. So look for, once you have enough knowledge, look for what inspires you, because that is what will motivate you. Remember what I was saying before, and I think this is kind of obvious, we are motivated emotionally, not by intellectual ideas. This is the most important thing in life. So where do you feel inspired really is such an important thing. Yeah. Good, yeah. Okay, yeah. so anyone else? We have one minute left to go, so quick, 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 quick. quick. <laughs> Last chance saloon. All right, good. So wonderful to meet you all, and I wish you all the very best. And good luck with your practice and everything. Yeah. And should we do the uh, not the other hand summer some Buddha to finish off? Is that a nice thing to do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that together. It's always nice to kind of pay homage to the triple gem. We have just been talking about the uh, the importance of the Buddha. So let's do that together. <coughs> Sangha 